Okay, so welcome to Turtle Power, everybody. Um, so I'll just re repeat for the sake of our recording, I'm Mary Gannon with the Rhode Island Division of Fish and Wildlife, and with me today is Gabby DeMalon, also from Fish and Wildlife, and we'll be tuning in with Gabby in the field in just a little bit. Uh, before we get started uh, talking about turtles and diving into uh, all this cool information, I want to see how you guys did on our turtle trivia. So the, our icebreaker turtle trivia here, what habitat do I live in? So we've got four different turtle species that uh, can be found in Rhode Island and they live in a variety of different habitats. So let's see if you guys got them right. So number one is a leatherback sea turtle. So they live in the ocean. A lot of people don't realize this, but Rhode Island's coasts, uh, we often get sea turtles swimming up and down the coast. They don't nest here, but they do use uh, the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, so we have uh, four different species of sea turtles that uh, can be found in the Atlantic up, up in New England. Uh, number two is the eastern box turtle. And box turtles are uh, pretty much uh, land turtles. They're kind of like a tortoise. Uh, they spend most of their time in the forest, um, wandering around eating berries and all sorts of stuff. Uh, don't really go into water uh, like a turtle you would, you would think of swimming. Number three, the diamondback terrapin, one of my favorite turtles uh, in Rhode Island. And this guy lives in salt marshes and estuaries. So an estuary is where salt water and fresh water meet together and they mix. So where a river is, is coming out to meet the ocean is an estuary. And last but not least, the red-eared slider here. And this little guy lives in freshwater ponds. And we'll talk a little bit about the red-eared slider and why this particular turtle is a little bit different from our, our other turtle species, but I won't, I won't uh, steal my own thunder yet. Okay, so here we are. I'm Mary over here. That's Gabby over there uh, with, some, with some diamondback terrapins in a marsh, and we are presenting Turtle Power. Uh, it's a really fun program. We love turtles, and summertime is the perfect time uh, to go out and observe turtles. So I hope you guys learn something new about turtles and that you can uh, take to your own observations of turtles in the wild. Uh, before we jump into turtles, though, I want to talk a little bit about what we do at the Division of Fish and Wildlife. Um, our mission here at the Division of Fish and Wildlife is to protect, restore, and manage our wildlife populations and their habitats. And we do this in a variety of ways, by studying animals, uh, by counting them, by tracking them, and by conserving habitat in our wildlife management areas. Uh, we also work with hunters to set all of the hunting rules and regulations that help keep our wildlife populations in balance. I have some pictures here of some different uh, work that we do uh, tracking animals like bobcats here. This bobcat's asleep getting a tracking collar. Uh, we track a, we've uh, tracked bobcats in South County in South Kingstown, uh, so pretty cool. Uh, New England cottontail, another native species that we're uh, very uh, concerned about and working on to track. Uh, we count Canada geese. We just finished up our, our annual Canada goose banding season, which is a fun opportunity to get out and uh, volunteer with us and you get to wrangle geese and put a little leg band on them and let them go. We, that helps us count uh, the population. Uh, again, conserving habitat in our management areas. Uh, we'll talk about ways that you can help uh, count reptiles and amphibians at the end of the presentation. Um, so that's, that's us in a nutshell. So working with hunters is really important to us um, at, Division, at the Division of Fish and Wildlife because believe it or not, hunters actually raise most of the money for the conservation work that we do here in Rhode Island. And that's by purchasing their hunting license every year. Uh, they contribute money to support many of the interesting projects we're working on, uh, some of those projects that I just mentioned. Uh, there's also a unique way that hunters and also target shooters, uh, so if you're like me, you don't hunt, maybe you have a bow and arrow and you just like to target shoot. Um, there's a great way that, uh, that folks who are hunting and target shooting help to protect habitat and wildlife uh, that, that, live, that lives in the habitat. Uh, so when they buy their firearms, ammunition, archery equipment, the companies that make those items have to pay a tax on those items. And that tax money gets divided up amongst all of the um, states. And then we have to use that money for conservation, for research, for habitat protection, and also for hunter education. And this helps not only the animals that hunters hunt, like deer, turkey, ducks, geese, uh, but also a lot of other wildlife species that share those habitats, like snakes, songbirds, and you guessed it, turtles. So let's talk turtles. Before we jump into telling you about all the turtles in Rhode Island, I want to do some trivia. I love trivia. So um, can you guys try to list 
all of the turtle species that live in Rhode Island or take a guess and you can type those in the chat and I'll open up the chat so I can see what we what we know. So what types of turtles live in Rhode Island? We've already given you some hints with the with our first trivia. Okay, I see Mariette said snapping turtle, most definitely. Spotted turtle, wood turtle, slider, painted turtle, snapping turtle, box turtle. Bob knows his turtles. Diamondback terrapin, Andrew, nice. Leatherback sea turtle, common snapping turtle, box turtle, painted turtle, wood turtle. Awesome. So we've got, you guys pretty much covered it. I think, oh, uh, there may be one that we didn't mention. Leatherback. Nice. Mud turtle, right? Yeah, the stink pot. The, uh, or musk turtle. Okay. So great. Thank you guys for participating in the trivia. Ooh, if I can click forward here. So we have six native species of freshwater turtles here in Rhode Island, and these guys live in ponds, streams, and rivers. Uh, we also have the one species of brackish water turtle, the diamondback terrapin, uh, that lives in estuaries. And then we also have four types of sea turtles that swim by our coasts. So here's our six freshwater turtle species. So the eastern painted turtle right up here is probably our most common turtle species that you'll see in the state. Uh, they're in most ponds all around Rhode Island and they're very comfortable living around humans. You'll see them in city parks and uh, golf courses all over the place. Eastern box turtles, this gorgeous turtle right in the middle, um, live almost entirely on land. You can find them in fields and woodland edges. Uh, they actually burrow in the ground in the winter and can close up their shells to protect themselves. So that's why they're called box turtles. So they've got um, the bottom of their shell is actually hinged and it whoop, shuts tight, tight, like a little, I think of it like a little garage door kind of, that it shuts um, and they can tuck their head and their limbs inside and nothing is going to get them out of their shell. They're really, really good at, at staying tucked in there. Snapping turtles, pretty sure everybody's probably seen a snapping turtle. Uh, they can grow very large. Uh, they have a very powerful bite, you know, that beak uh, on their on their mouth uh, is very sharp and, and tough, um, and they have a very long neck. Now, they may look kind of scary, but they're actually pretty afraid of people, and they'll swim away if they see you in the water. A lot of people get nervous. Oh, no, it's going to snap off my toes if I, if I find it in the pond. Uh, they're most likely going to try to get away from you. They don't, they don't want to be bothered. Spotted turtles, this little guy down here with the polka dots, uh, these guys are pretty rare in Rhode Island, and they're very sensitive to changes in their habitat. Uh, so we're currently studying their populations uh, to see where they are and how they're doing. Eastern musk turtles, aka the stink pot turtle. I love these little guys. They're a lot of fun. Um, these guys are fairly common. Uh, they like running streams and rivers. Um, I have personally only seen a musk turtle once in my life, and it's not because they're uncommon. It's because they're really good at hiding. Uh, and they like to hide down in the, the muck and the mud at the bottom of the stream or the river. Uh, and they, they kind of stink a little bit, so that's why they're called the musk turtle or the stink pot. Uh, last but not least, the wood turtle, uh, so these guys all the way down here, are also pretty rare in the state. And they live partly uh, in running fresh water and like streams and rivers uh, and partly on land. And they like to eat mushrooms and worms. Uh, this is also a turtle that we are concerned about uh, in the state and we're always on the lookout for. The diamondback terrapin is our brackish water turtle, really gorgeous, gorgeous turtle. Um, and they're very unique because they're the only turtle that you can find uh, in mixed and freshwater uh, estuaries. And the diamondback terrapin is a state endangered species here in Rhode Island. Uh, and the reason why they're endangered is because a long time ago, uh, people used to actually harvest them to eat. Uh, they would eat the turtles themselves and they would eat the eggs. Uh, so if anybody's ever heard of turtle soup, uh, this is the turtle that was used in, in turtle soup. And not only were um, you know, they eaten and, and hunted uh, to eat, but their habitats were also destroyed uh, or heavily developed. If you look at uh, most of the coast of Rhode Island, there's a lot of houses, there's a lot of uh, roads and development. Uh, so that has an impact on our wildlife. 
they also have a lot of nest predators. So I have this very diabolical looking uh, raccoon. Uh, raccoons, possums, foxes, uh, even uh, turkeys will, will go after the hatchlings and the eggs. Um, so it's, it's tough to be a baby terrapin uh, out in the world. So right now, um, you know, people aren't eating these turtles for turtle soup, uh, but a big problem that a lot of turtles are facing uh, is poaching uh, for the pet trade. So people aren't poaching animals. We think of poaching, you know, oh, they poach Af uh, African elephants or tigers uh, for their fur. Um, we don't really think of poaching as something that happens here in Rhode Island, but it does. Um, so the problem with, with terrapins and some other turtle species is that people will collect them alive and then they'll go sell them in the pet trade. Uh, which is not good and that is a really really bad thing for for our turtle populations so we're doing some research on turtles uh, to help our turtles here in Rhode Island and it's it's really a lot of cool uh, stuff that's going on uh, the story of terrapin conservation in Rhode Island is actually pretty amazing uh, so in Barrington a bunch of folks uh, discovered that there were terrapins nesting on a farm uh, in the area and they said oh my gosh we have to do something to to help these turtles uh, because they're very rare in the state. So in 1990, the Barrington Land Conservation Trust was formed, and they have been preserving uh, turtle nests and protecting the, the nests and the hatchlings ever since. And this is amazing. They've done awesome, awesome work, and they really helped to boost our um, terrapin population in the state. And prior to, uh, prior to this discovery, we thought that terrapins were, were gone from Rhode Island, and then they discovered them there and we thought, oh, this is the only spot that they're left in Rhode Island. Uh, but uh, now that um, we've joined up with the, the Barrington Land Conservation Trust and we've partnered with them to help out with this research, uh, we've also expanded this research a little bit uh, to cover other areas of the state. So we now have what we're calling the turtle drone. Uh, so we have a, a drone that we use. Um, so our state herpetologist, that's our biologist who studies reptiles and amphibians, that's Scott standing right there uh, with one of our seasonal techs, Liam. And this picture of Scott and Liam was taken by our drone. And what, what they do with the drone is they actually fly it up over a salt marsh and they fly it around and they go you know, high enough that they're not gonna bother anything. And you can see down into the water, because um, the water is very clear, you can see turtles uh, swimming around. So this has helped us identify uh, new places where turtles, uh, where terrapins might be um, might be living, might be nesting. Uh, we've also worked with volunteers to go out and search for terrapins um, as they poke their, their heads out of the water in the marsh. And by, uh, by using the drone and by working with, um, with our volunteers, we've discovered some new spots in the state where this turtle is. And that's a huge success. We're really, really excited about this because uh, we want these turtles to do well. So now you might not have, um, a drone, but there's uh, other ways that we can help turtles, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but one of the one of the biggest things, and Bob had said this uh, early in the in the chat before we started recording, uh, was that he found a turtle crossing the road, so he helped it cross the road. And this happens a lot, right? Because people have we have a lot of roads, we have a lot of uh, cars on the road, and we've split up turtle habitat. Um, what used to be, you know, a, a piece of forest or a piece of wetland that was completely uninterrupted is now chopped up into little tiny pieces uh, by roads, by houses, by buildings. And we call this fragmentation, habitat fragmentation. And it makes it really difficult for turtles to move from one place to the other. And often it leads to uh, turtles getting hit by cars. Um, so turtles cross the roads to find food, they're looking for a mate, uh, to find habitat, to nest, um, or maybe their, their habitat is no longer livable where they are, so they're, they're moving to another place. Um, and so, you know, I always say to people, you know, think about it. If you, um, you know, live in, in your home and you have your bedroom and there's the kitchen, if somebody built a road in between your bedroom and the kitchen, how would you go get food? How would you get something out of the fridge? How would you get water? Um, would you risk crossing the road? Uh, so this is something that, that turtles face every day, this dilemma. Oh, should I cross the road? Should I not? Is it okay over here? Or is the grass greener over there? Um, so that being said, if you find a turtle crossing the road, there's a lot of things that you can do to help. Um, and there's kind of a process that you should, that you should take. Uh, so first things first, if you see a turtle in the road, you should always, always look both ways, make sure nobody is 
coming on either side of the road and that it's safe to get out of your car or to step onto the road. Um, and you should always make sure, uh, you know, if you're a kid, make sure you have an adult to help you. Um, if you're an adult, you should maybe have a buddy with you to look out for, for cars uh, to make sure no one's coming. Uh, you can carefully move the turtle in the direction it was heading. Uh, and this is important because turtles know where they're going, right? They're saying, I want to go in that direction. So if you pick up that turtle and put him back where he started, he's just going to cross the road again. So we don't want that to happen. We want to make sure that turtle gets safely where it wants to be. Uh, if it's a snapping turtle, this can get a little tricky because uh, we said they have a powerful bite and sometimes it can be a little ornery. Uh, so the, the best thing to do with a snapping turtle is you can kind of scoot it from behind with, with a stick um, or maybe a broom. Um, you can also hold its shell, the base of um, the back of its shell, and kind of walk it across the road like a little wheelbarrow. Um, and once you get the turtle on the other side of the road, make sure it's a few feet away from the road. So into the, the brush or the grass, whatever um, vegetation is, is on the other side of the road. And um, it's important to, you know, to note when you're handling turtles, you should you know, pick them up uh, by their shell on, on either side. Um, you should never pick a turtle up by its tail. This is very painful for the turtle. Uh, you can see pictures online of people holding the snappy turtle up by its tail. Uh, that's, that tail is connected to the turtle's spine. Uh, and that's, that's very uncomfortable for a turtle to be held by its tail. Uh, so, you know, using all those methods that we just said are the safest way for both you and the turtle uh, to get it across the road. And one of the most important things to remember is to never bring a turtle home or move it to another location. Uh, so, um, you know, if you move a turtle to another location, it's like somebody picking you up at your home and saying, oh, let me move you down three towns over. Um, you know, I live in Cranston. If I live in Cranston, somebody picked me up and they drove me all the way to Westerly and they said, you can live here now. I'd be like, oh wait, where's my home? I, I'm confused. I don't know where to go. Um, I don't know where to live. So maybe I'd try to get back to my home. That's exactly what the turtles do. Um, so they, they know their home range and they're always just going to try to get back. So they can actually get really confused if we move them to a new location. And, you know, taking turtles home as pets, we'll talk about, um, we'll talk about the problem, the problems with taking a turtle home and keeping it. So once you've done all those things, congratulations, you've saved a turtle and been a turtle hero. So poaching is a big, big issue. Uh, turtles belong in the wild. They are like all wild animals, right? They're very sensitive. They need special habitat. Uh, they need special diets to survive. Uh, they also live for a really long time. I just saw a cool thing on the Massachusetts uh, Fish and Wildlife Instagram that they've been tracking spotted turtles uh, since 1993. And this one turtle that they've been tracking, she was like 25 years old when they found her. And now that's 25 years later. So this, the turtle is like almost 50 years old and she's still pretty young, right? So turtles can live a long time. So if you have a turtle um, as a pet or, or at home, um, that's a huge time commitment. It's not like having a hamster. Um, it's also against the law to take a turtle from the wild and keep it as a pet uh, because this can really harm our native turtle populations. Uh, because turtles take so long to grow old enough to, um, to lay their eggs, taking a turtle out of the wild can affect how many baby turtles are added to that population in the future. We want lots of baby turtles in the future, right? Uh, another uh, big threat to um, our native turtles, aside from poaching, um, is uh, actually invasive species. So if you guys remember that uh, red-eared slider, the fourth turtle in our trivia, um, that red-eared slider is actually not native to Rhode Island. It was introduced here because uh, people had them as pets and they actually let them go into ponds because they realized, oh, this turtle's getting too old. I don't know how to take care of it. Be free in the pond. Um, and they let it go into the pond and they've completely taken over uh, certain ponds in Rhode Island and they compete with our native turtles for food, water, shelter, and space, all those things that they, they need to survive. So it makes it a little harder for our native turtles. So the last awesome and really fun way uh, that you can help turtles is to become a Herp Observer. Uh, so Herp Observer is a cool app that we uh, developed at Fish and Wildlife. It's free to download on your phone. And uh, basically what you do with Herp Observer is you take a photo of any reptile or amphibian that you uh, see either in your yard or at the park or out on a hike. And whether it's a common species, whether it's a rare species, we want to know. Uh, because the cool thing about Herp Observer is you take that photo and it sends your observation directly to our herpetologist, Scott. And Scott can get that information and put it on a map and see where all of these critters are living. 
and this information only goes to Scott. It doesn't uh, doesn't go out to the public, and that helps us to gather information about really sensitive species like wood turtles, spotted turtles, and diamondback terrapins, uh, as well as some of our cool amphibians as well. So if you are interested in becoming a herp observer, uh, you can go to the link that's right there on the slide. And uh, later on, as, as we move forward, we'll, um, we'll put all that information in the, uh, in the chat as well. So I've talked long enough. I think it's time for us to get out in the field and talk with Gabby and see if she found any turtles in her turtle trap. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? <laughs> So I'm over here, I have a turtle trap that is set over here in the water and I'm gonna check it and see if we got any turtles in here. Um, and I do see some rippling, so hopefully there's something in here. I think Mary's gonna head on over so I can grab this trap out uh, without dropping my phone into the water. <laughs> um, so the traps that we have set in here are called hoop traps. And I actually have one out of the water right here that I can show you quickly as Mary heads over. Um, but this is a hoop trap, and this is what we typically use to trap turtles. And inside, you can see there's a little pool noodle, and that's because turtles, they need to breathe air. So they can hold their breath for a very long time, but they still need oxygen. They need to come up and take a breath every once in a while. And so we need to make sure that this trap floats a little bit so they can stick their head up and still breathe some air. Um, so we're going to switch videos in one minute. Okay, she's going to run, go get something. Um, so this hoop trap also has inside of it this little bottle. And in here, there's bait to try to lure the turtles in. And we'll use things uh, like sardines. They really like sardines or even cat food to try to lure the turtles in. They love it. It stinks. It smells really good in the water. So they come on over. And when they come in, they come in through this narrow entrance right here. And it is open. So it is possible for them to get out but they usually have a hard time finding their way out. And so they get stuck in the trap and that's when we pull them out. All right, so we're gonna, I'm gonna hand this over to Mary and she can switch it over. There we go. All right, so this is our empty trap. Nothing in that one. We'll check this one over here in the water. We always make sure to tie it onto a tree just in case the turtle swims away with the trap, which has happened before. So always make sure you tie it securely. Snapping turtles are very strong, so they can pull a trap into the middle of the water, which would not be good. You have to go all the way in with waders. Oh, yeah. Three, four, four turtles. Oh, my gosh. It's wow. <laughs> a lot of turtles. That's a lot of turtles. That's awesome. All right. Now, well, let's see what we've got in here. Looks like we have four painted turtles. So these are our most common turtle species. I probably won't keep all of these in here. Yes, because it's gonna make a mess. So I'll pull them out through that little hole. Let's see, the first one we got, this looks like a female. And so you can tell the males and the females apart for painted turtles by looking at their beautiful nails. So these ones are short, so that's a female. Males have really long nails. I'll see if I got one in here. And they actually use those long nails to kind of show off for the females. They'll swim in front of them and go, look at my beautiful nails, look at my beautiful nails. And then the females, We'll want to meet with them. All right, so I'll let this first one run away. Into the water. Okay, let's see. Oh, I definitely see a male in here. All right, this one looks like a male. Come on out, buddy. Hard when they have beautiful long nails. So for this one, let's see. Oh, it's a little bit nervous with the camera. But you can see he's got those really long, beautiful nails. Oh, there you go. And so that's the way that you can tell painted turtle males and females apart. For a lot of other species of turtles, they'll have this um, concave or this indent in their plastron, which is the bottom shell. And then the top shell we call the carapace. So I'll let him go to there his little buddy into the water. He wants to bath. <laughs> All right, there he goes. So normally we would take data on all of these turtles, but this is just to show you how we take data. So I'm not gonna keep them all in the, the trap. I wanna let them go as soon as possible um, to reduce stress. We've got another female here. She's pretty cute. Females are also a little bit larger in painted turtles, but that really varies depending on the species because snapping turtles, the males are actually larger because they fight for the females. 
right there. All right, this last one we'll take data on. I can't let him get, a, get away because we only have one left. All right, this one looks like it has some algae on it. And a lot of our turtle species will grow this algae on them. So you can see he looks kind of greenish, or she looks kind of greenish. Um, so snapping turtles will grow this on them. Also musk turtles usually are covered in algae, so like almost like furry. All right, so when we're trapping turtles, we don't catch them just for fun usually. Um, we catch them to take data. And so we'll take things like measurements of their carapace and their plaster. Remember the top and the bottom shell. We've got a set of calipers here that measure um, how big they are. So we usually do the carapace length. So from the front to the back, just like that. So you can see the length. So this guy looks like 133.2 millimeters long. And then we do the width, which is across this way. So the carapace width, if I could use the scalpers. There we go. So it looks like 102.0. And then we do the same thing with the plastrons. We would measure the length of the plastron and the width of the plastron, that bottom shell. And then we also would measure how tall it is. And with these, we can tell how big these turtles are getting. So we need to know, are they older? Are they younger? Do they seem healthy? So obviously younger turtles are smaller. But then the bigger turtles, if we have like really small pieces of turtles in a population, maybe that means something's wrong. Maybe that means it's an unhealthy population. They're not getting enough resources. Um, so it's really important to take that data. And then we would take the weight. So we've got the scale right here. And normally, I don't have one with me. I should have brought one. We actually weigh the turtles in a pillowcase, which is pretty silly. So you put the turtle into the pillowcase and then we loop it up just like this and we would weigh it. So it's a pretty ridiculous way to weigh a turtle, but we actually weigh a lot of things in pillowcases. <laughs> very, very useful. All right, I'm gonna grab this camera for one minute. The last thing that we would do is we would mark the turtle. And so this is a file, it's called the triangular file and this has been used for years to mark turtles. And when you're marking them, you look at the number, um, so these outer, outer uh, scales are called marginal scoots. So those are just the outside scales on the top of the carapace. And you would count them um, to decide how to mark the turtle. And each turtle gets a unique code. And so um, it depends on where you are in the world. Sometimes it's A, B, C, D, E. Sometimes it's one, two, three, four, five. Um, and you count all the way around. And then you would just um, file down whatever scoot you were going to mark. So you just file down. I'm not going to mark this guy because we don't need to. But basically, you just make a tiny little notch in there, and the next time you catch him, you can identify him. Because if I was just to take turtle and look at them, weigh them, measure them, release them, I might catch the tur same turtle over and over again, and I might think, there's a hundred turtles in this pond. But really, I just caught the same turtle over and over again. So this is called mark and recapture. It's a really, really common method. And filing these turtles doesn't hurt them at all. It's almost like getting your nails cut. So it's just like a, a nail stem. And I'd write down all of my data. You're muted. You're muted. Remember, we have to say on mute.
Sorry, Gabby, we, we were muted for a, oh. for a second. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> so we have, we have a few different species of greatest conservation need in the state. And those are the ones that we focus on. So I am not the state herpetologist, that's Scott Buchanan. I wish he could be here today, but I have done a lot of work with turtles and I've helped him out on a lot of his projects. And he's really passionate about saving these um, species and making sure they're protected. And one of the reasons why is because humans are the ones that are threatening these turtles. So Mary talked about habitat fragmentation. Well, that wouldn't be a thing except for us, right? We put the roads there, we put the houses there, and we um, kind of build stuff on their habitat and that causes habitat loss. So it's really up to us to help these species. So we have Eastern fox turtles here. You guys saw that picture. So we do projects with Eastern fox turtles, spotted turtles, um, and diamondback terrapins and wood turtles, which are so cool. And all of those are species of greatest conservation need, which means they just need a little bit more help. There's something that's threatening them um, and their species is not doing all that well. And so we need to do something to help them. Um, so with that, I think I covered just about everything. We'll let this little guy go. Wanna come over here? Yeah. Our last little friend. We'll let him go. So we have a ton of painted turtles in here. They're really common. I'm sure you guys have seen them. They're a lot of times called sun turtles too. So they're just painted turtles. They look really, really similar to red eared sliders, but they're different. Put them a little closer. I'm a little shy. Like I've been hard for too long. There we go. Oh, there we go. Bye. 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 <laughs> All right. And then we've got our trap here. In case you couldn't see it with me trying to hold it. This is our hoop trap. They're also used for crayfish, for catching crayfish. And if we get a bigger turtle in here, because I have gotten, I don't know how, but really big snapping turtles into these tiny little traps. <laughs> it's really good to have the zipper on so you can get them off this way. You can always reach in that way if you need to. Um, mine did not have that zipper. <laughs> it is a special modification, so definitely good to have. And I should mention um, that, I know Mary mentioned it before, but it is, it's not legal to collect turtles and bring them home as pets. You need a special license in order to catch things um, other than snapping turtles. And snapping turtles you need a fishing license to catch. Um, yeah, and other than that, just remember, if you do see a turtle, definitely report it to us on Herp Observer, but make sure not to post locations of turtles on things like Facebook um, or Instagram or any of that, because those turtles are really sensitive and there might be poachers out there looking at where you posted them um, or where you found them. So just make sure, just, you can say, I found this turtle, but never put where it was. Just report it to us because ours is secure, so no one will know, except for Scott. <laughs> All right, so do we have any questions? Yeah, let's go to some questions. So if anybody has questions for Gabby or for me or about turtles, about other things that we do at Fish and Wildlife, you can just type them right into the chat. We have someone asking, we have seen several snappers laying in our condo complex. Can you talk about that? So talking about laying turtles eggs. laying eggs, um, you know, in people's yards or yeah. whatever it might be. Yeah, so turtles, they'll lay eggs um, anywhere where there's kind of loose um, sandy soil or dirt that's just kind of... Um, loose enough for them to dig into and so we do get a lot of calls every year about snapping turtles or other species of turtles um, nesting in yards and if they do come up to nest in your yard you can just kind of leave them alone um, they'll probably dig a hole they'll lay some eggs in there snapping turtles lay a lot of eggs usually i think around like 20 we can lay like 26 or more eggs um, so they'll lay their eggs in the yard cover it up and then you can just leave it there if you're interested in seeing um, if they do hatch, you can put like a little marker in there and they should hatch in the fall, like early fall and they'll all come out. But if you're concerned about having snapping turtles, just remember they're just like any other turtle species. They, they don't want to go near us. They're, they're going to swim away. They're going to walk away. If they see you, just, just leave them be. And they should be fine. Okay. So we've got another ooh, good question. Uh, Bob asked, how do you handle data about turtles you find on the border with another state? So if we found you know, like I'm thinking something yes. like Diamondback Terrapin, you know, we, we share the bay. Yeah. And like, yeah, so we'd work with the other South agency um, to try to protect whatever habitat we could. And also, you know, the Diamondback Terrapin said um, they 
their brackish waters, they're going to be in an estuary, but they'll have to nest on land. So they're going to nest probably on one side or the other, unless there's good habitat on both. So you just work with the other agency to try to um, coordinate how you're going to help protect those species. Good question. Any other questions about turtles? And I also, I meant to mention also, the reason um, why turtles are, need to be protected so much other than that it's, you know, us that are breaking up and destroying their habitat. The other reason is because turtles take a really long time to reach sexual maturity, to have their eggs, to lay eggs. And so they can take, you know, 10 or 15 years to even be able to lay eggs. And then those eggs usually have a really hard time even hatching because there are a lot of predators. I know Mary mentioned raccoons and foxes are predators of diamondback terrapins. There are a lot of other predators um, of a lot of our turtle species as well. And so the nests will get dug up a lot. So it's really hard for turtles to grow old enough to lay eggs and then even for those eggs to hatch. So it's really important for us to protect that. Even taking just one turtle out of a population um, can devastate that entire population to make it fast. Gabby, I'm gonna hand this camera back to you. I'm gonna <laughs> go to my camera. All right. Maybe you can share. Sure, yeah. All right, I'm gonna flip this around so I can see what I'm seeing. Maybe. All right. Okay, there we go. There we go. Here I am again. <laughs> All right, so I think Mary's gonna hop on and show um, some of our social media um, options that we have. So we do have a Facebook, we have Instagram, um, so you can always connect with us on there. If you have any questions, you can email us or you can um, ask us on Facebook, ask us on Instagram, and, and we'll be sure to try to reach out to you and answer those questions as best we can. So Gabby, we have, we have another question here. Oh, sure. Um, so Mariette asked, what is a turtle's heat tolerance? I like to watch them haul out onto a rock, but I think eventually they get too hot and go back into the water. This is a great question. What is, sorry, what is their pain tolerance? Their, their heat tolerance. Sorry, their heat I'm tolerance. <laughs> That's a good question. I, I don't know what the highest heat that they can um, sustain is. It probably depends on the species. Um, but a really interesting fact um, relating to turtles and heat is that a lot of turtle species, their eggs, where they're placed in the ground, so the temperature um, of the egg that's placed in the ground, so if it's higher up, it might be warmer. If it's lower down, it might be cooler. Um, that depends, uh, that determines what their sex is gonna be. So I think it's males, I believe it's males um, hatch from cooler locations and females from warmer locations. So it can just be in the same nest. The bottom might all be you know, males, the top could all be females. So it's pretty, pretty awesome. All right, I'm seeing a lot of questions pop up. Um, so I saw, let's see. Um, all right, so we have, what species of turtles are endangered? Um, so all of the sea turtles that pass by our coasts are endangered, and then the diamondback terrapin is state endangered. Um, and then I listed those other species of greatest conservation needs. So even though they might not be listed as um, indeed, like endangered by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, they still need our help. Um, it takes a lot for, for species to get listed on there, um, but they still, they still need our protection. Um, we have, how do you build a turtle trap? Um, so, like I mentioned before, you have to have a license to trap turtles, um, a scientific, scientific collector's permit. But um, these are actually just crayfish traps. So you order them online and then you can modify them uh, for turtles. And then we have, let's see, what other types of turtles live in the USA? That is a big, big one. <laughs> we have tons of different types of turtles that live in the US. Um, so I mentioned alligator snapping turtles. I mean, there's an endless list. There's Western painted turtles. Um, there are soft shell turtles. If you haven't seen those, you should look them up because they're really weird looking and they're really, really cool. Um, they live more in like the Midwest and Southern states. Um, I mean, there are so many species of turtles in the US, but you should definitely look them up because they're not all the same. They're all really, really different and, and really unique and cool. 
thinking of the gopher tortoise in uh, Florida. What is it? The gopher tortoise. Oh, the gopher tortoises. They're, they're really awesome. Cool. Yeah. yeah they're, they, there's so many. I, I can't even list them all. <laughs> they're all so cool and different. Uh, do we have anything else, Mary? Anything else? I don't, I don't see any other questions. I posted all of our stuff here um, in the chat for Instagram, Facebook. Also, we have a YouTube channel. If you guys like cool animal videos, Gabby and I have been working really hard this summer to put together some fun stuff uh, for everybody to watch. Um, oh, we have a, a question. Are all pet turtles poached? So if Not, you the turtle yeah. in the pet store, does it mean it was poached? Yeah, so all turtles are not poached, definitely not. Um, but our native turtles, um, if you were to take them from here out of the wild and keep as a pet, that would be illegal. But there are special permits, like I said, that you can get, but definitely um, not all uh, turtles that you find in the pet store are poached. A lot of them are collected legally. It's just, we're worried about people that are doing it without their licenses because then they don't know, or they don't care to follow the rules. And so they might take too many um, and where they're not supposed to, because if you take a turtle out of one population um, that's healthy and it can take that one turtle coming out, then it, it might be okay. But if, if you take it out of a really sensitive population that's already not doing well, that's when it's a problem. Another thing we might want to talk about, Gabby, is um, releasing turtles as pets. So say you got a turtle, pet turtle at the pet store, you decide you don't want it anymore, you can't take care of it, and you say, oh, I'll just let it go into the ecosystem. Not only does that, we talked about invasive species and how they um, can cause problems for our native turtles, but um, they, that can also introduce disease into a population of turtles. So if that turtle is sick, you're just introducing a sick turtle into a pond and you can make the other turtles sick. Um, they also may not, not do well, you know, if it's a turtle that is a pet, um, that is a species that is originally from, you know, more southern location, a warmer location, it may not be adapted to survive uh, here in Rhode Island where it freezes in the winter. Mm -hmm. um, so it may not be the best for your, for your pet either. So those types of things, we always say you can try to find a, a rescue. Um, there's like pet rescues, turtle rescues around that, that might be able to take them. Um, but you know, my, my rule of thumb is usually like, you know, turtles don't make the best pets um, for, for many reasons because they're pretty tricky to take care of. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, our gopher tortoise is big. Uh, they're 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 not huge. They're like medium sized. I guess. Yeah, they're not huge. They're not like the the big tortoises um, that you see, like not the South American ones, the, the Galapagos tortoise or anything like that. But they're still really cool. They live in burrows and they actually um, coexist with gopher snakes, so they live together in the holes, which is extremely. Yeah, those are the guys that they live in the um, a long leaf pine which is like our pitch pine forest. So it needs fire to regenerate the forest, to regrow. Um, so they hide in little burrows when the fires go over the landscape. So they tuck down into the burrows to escape the fire, mm -hmm. uh, which is really cool. But they dig the little burrows and it allows other animals to escape the fire too. So they're mm -hmm. kind of like a keystone species, which means that they, they, them living their lives normally helps like a bunch of other animals. Um, mm -hmm. Same thing with like beavers. Beavers are a keystone species. They create new ponds. Uh, for our turtles here in Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. Oh, we have another question here. Estimated population of box, wood, and spotted turtles in Rhode Island. So that's the, the million dollar question. Uh, <laughs> we do not know. And that's, um, that's where, um, you know, Scott's doing all these surveys. He's out there doing surveys, you know, this week, and, and this is like go time for him. Um, the early summer is, is turtle time. Uh, but that's where, you know, participating in our citizen science uh, program, Herp Observer, uh, that's really going to help us because then that, that uh, alerts Scott as to where, um, you know, a new population might be that he may not be aware of. Um, and then he can kind of do counts um, like, like, you know, Gabby was catching the turtles and we would mark and recapture the turtles. That's a good way to count them. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's hard. It is very hard, not just with turtles, but for any animal to get a, an accurate estimate of the population because <laughs> things move, <laughs> right? They don't sit still, so you can count them. Uh, things like to hide. Um, and it's just, it's just tough. It's really tough. Um, so we're, we're trying to get that, that um, you know, a better handle on that. Uh, because maybe there are more than we think there are, or maybe there are less than we think there are. Uh, so that's mm -hmm. always important. Um, and that's the, the a challenging part of wildlife biology, is, is making sure you have an idea of the population sizes and then keeping those populations in balance. Uh, this is something we do with 
um, you know, with game species like deer and turkey and ducks and, and making sure that you're, you're keeping them all in the balance and you know exactly, you know, relatively how many there are. Mm -hmm. Then we can get into trouble with, um, with, with uh, losing our species. We always want to keep common things common, as they mm -hmm. say. So if there are no other questions, I think that's all we've got. Yep. <laughs> So we hope that you guys have enjoyed this, that you've uh, had fun learning about turtles, that you share what you learned with your friends and your family, uh, and that you get to see some turtles out, out and about this summer. Uh, so if you uh, want to contact us, um, you can find us on, um, on Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube. Uh, you can always go to the DEM website, uh, dem.ri.gov, um, and you can find us there as well. So... Thank you guys. Oh, I'm seeing everybody say thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. So I'm going to stop our recording. If I can figure it out. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.